Welcome, and today we're taking a look at the mission of Galahad 2. This is an attempt to do an Apollo-esque lunar mission in Kerbal Space Program. I say Apollo-esque because rather than attempting to recreate a Saturn V rocket, put it in orbit around the moon, land and return, I instead elected to set a different set of mission goals. Specifically, I wanted to go all the way to the moon, I wanted to land on the moon, I wanted to put a rover down on the surface of the moon, deploy a bunch of the new deployable science experiments and utility options that were made available during the breaking ground expansion, and also deploy a satellite. So to do that, I constructed the vessel that you're seeing take off right now, the Galahad. And the design of this thing was actually a lot of fun. I wanted to make sure I was able to do it in a single launch and that it was reasonably aesthetically appealing and that the mission itself had a bunch of different layers so that it was technically rewarding. You're seeing now that we've gotten into orbit, we're circularizing around Kerbin right now, separating our heavy lift stage so that it is put on a suborbital trajectory back into the surface of Kerbin so we don't leave any debris in orbit, although there's definitely debris left later in the episode. And now we're circularizing around 150,000 meters or 150 kilometers above the surface of Kerbin. You see this nice cinematic shot of the sunrise over the surface or over the horizon of Kerbin. If you like that cinematic shot and you want to see some other kind of cinematic footage of this exact same mission, I did a much shorter, pretty interesting cinematic music video inspired by the Kerbal Space Program 2 trailer. And I'll link that on screen right now and again at the end of the video as we separate the fairing, revealing what is ultimately the payload and the mission to move that payload all the way to the moon. Now we're planning our lunar injection burn. We still have plenty of Delta V, including some left on our orbital stage. Now that the service module, the lander can, the capsule is all exposed, we have the opportunity to extend our solar panels so that we're now generating electricity so we can continue to power our rocket as we execute our lunar injection burn. It's a very pic picturesque site. If you like the way that the graphics look in Kerbal Space Program on screen right now, the mods list is available in the description. Of course, I've got Eve and Scatterer both enabled, which is where we're getting that pretty background, as well as some of the haze and the city lights and what have you over Kerbin. Now we're separating that orbital stage, and this is the vehicle that's going to take us all the way to the moon. At the tip of the rocket, now you can see that the lander can is exposed. We've got three Kerbins, Kerbals on board today. Of course, Jeb and Bob are along for the ride. Bob's actually going to be taking the lander all the way to the surface. As we see another one of those pretty cinematic shots, and our vehicle falls away from Kerbin and arrives at the moon. Before we get to the moon, we plan our capture burn. Remember, we've got a satellite on board that I want to put into orbit around the moon. It's in a big elliptical orbit really serves no function at all other than I wanted to make sure that I was able to transport a pretty heavy payload on this mission. I wanted to be able to deploy a satellite kind of as a proof of concept so in later missions if I wanted to establish a communications network around the moon to support lunar operations I could do so using this rocket. I've never actually used the service module before but here you see it separating. When it does separate you see the bay doors kind of fall away which is kind of cool because using the new robotics that are available in Kerbal Space Program you can use hinges which is how I managed to expose this satellite and then I launched it using a decoupler and then I deploy the solar panels put it in a little spin and leave it in a big high elliptical orbit around the moon achieving the first of our mission objectives for this rocket launch now that we've got that satellite in orbit we're gonna go ahead and decrease our periapsis and our apoapsis to about 10,000 meters or 10 kilometers above the surface of the moon as this is an Apollo-esque style lunar mission. The way that the rest of the mission will go is after we capture and we circularize at 10k, we'll separate our lander from our service module. We'll leave two Kerbals in the service module and then one, Bob, will go ahead and go down to the surface of the moon, perform all of the surface expedition operations to include establishing a research location or outpost and then return back to orbit where he'll rendezvous with that orbital service module in flight and then return to Kerbin. Another one of those gorgeous cinematic shots. There's just something about the way Kerbal Space Program feels once you manage to actually get away from Kerbin and put some crafts into orbit. It's absolutely gorgeous. For the first time, we're now revealing a rover. So I actually managed to use the robotic parts to help fold away the legs and then store it internal to the service module. If you're 
wondering how I kind of jutted it out from the fuselage of the vehicle. I used a piston. So there's a piston there. You can see the back of it kind of clipped through the service module. I used an action group to extend it. And then I can deploy the wheels. So ultimately I've got a little Mooner module or Mooner rover that is hidden inside the service module that I can then go capture with my lander and take with me to the surface. So there's a lot of different ways to deploy rovers. Um, rovers are, are almost useless, frankly, in this game, but they're so much fun to make um, that I do it all the time. And, and I'd never attempted to deploy one to the surface of a planet or a satellite before in this way. And so I, I felt inspired to do it this way this time. So now we've got Bob on board the lander. He's activated his RCS ports and he's using up a little bit of mono propellant to get in line with that MEV, that Mooner Expedition Vehicle. And now I'm looking at the nav ball in the bottom of my screen, making sure my prograde vector is aligned to my target indicator and that the two vessels are completely aligned so that I can achieve a seamless capture. Then because I did use some monopropellant in those orbital operations or maneuvers, I'm going to transfer monopropellant from the service module back into the lander before finally topping off on fuel, separating orienting myself retrograde with respect to my movement and then activating my first landing burn with the Mooner Expedition vehicle on top of my lander, Bob piloting that landing craft all the way down to the surface as we take a look at a really pretty IVA shot. Get our gear extended. This craft doesn't have a ton of delta V in the lander, however, it's got plenty to take that heavy payload all the way to the surface and then we'll shed some of that payload on the way back up because we won't be bringing the rover with us back to orbit and we also won't be taking our landing legs with us back to orbit so we get some delta B back in that respect and as always I kind of do a, an aggressive initial burn until I'm comfortable that I'll be able to slow my horizontal movement I find my shadow on the ground I could activate my uh, above ground altitude on the top of the screen. I chose not to this time. Probably just wasn't thinking about it because a lunar landing isn't particularly challenging, especially here in the highlands where it's pretty flat. Anytime you're doing an equatorial landing on the moon, you, you can trust that some flat terrain will be available somewhere. And as we look off into the distance, we see some lunar rocks, which is great because we've got a robotic arm equipped to our lunar expedition vehicle. So we'll be able to go around the surface and explore a little bit and put that Mooner arm or that robotic arm into action, collecting all that tasty science as Bob effectively lands the landing craft on the ground, exits, and before he even touches the dirt, activates his RCS pack and then rises to take a seat in the Mooner Expedition vehicle. So this was actually one of the more technically challenging portions of the mission. It seems kind of simple, but I threw some mono propellant on my MEV, the Mooner Expedition vehicle, and I, I put some RCS ports or some um, monopropellant ports on the bottom of the craft, but it was really kind of difficult and challenging to control. So some F9 and some F5 absolutely did happen, but we managed to finally deploy the legs, deploy the gear, activate brakes, and get the rover on the ground. Once the rover's on the ground, we can activate our solar panel so that we're soaking up some sunlight so that we can power the rest of the electronics on board the MEV, including the lights, the antenna, the arm. And if you look at the rear of the MEV, we actually have a cargo container. Inside of that cargo container is the first of what will ultimately be six deployable pieces of equipment. Those first three are going to provide power and communication. So we'll get our, our comm net established. We'll get some solar panels and a, a ground-based RTG deployed on the surface to begin the construction of our moon outpost. This is actually the first time, frankly, that I've ever used deployables. I've never really had a reason. I don't play a ton of science or career mode, but uh, but I wanted the additional challenge. I wanted to see these kind of really cool animations. They did not disappoint. It add, adds a little bit of a reward and a little bit of extra challenge each time you bring a little bit of extra mass along the way. And, and it gives Bob a reason to come all the way here and to establish this little research outpost. So now we've got our solar panels, our comm net, and our RTG on the surface as, long, as well as our MEV. However, that's really not enough to run any cool science experiments. So I packaged this little guy. This little probe on board actually has an additional three pieces of deployable equipment along with two teeny tiny engines and a little bit of liquid fuel in a probe core 
and I attempted this several times. This was really hard. It was hard because the probe core that I elected to use doesn't have SAS, and so I had to manually pilot this guy all the way in. It was hard because I didn't have the ability to generate any additional power on board this probe, so there's no solar panels or anything like that. Um, so it was all done manually, and it was done with a running time clock. And I wanted to put down this cargo as near as possible or as reasonable to the original MEV and landing craft site so that Bob wouldn't have to go on too crazy an adventure to go retrieve the contents of this craft. You can definitely tell there's no SAS there towards the end as I, I fight with uh, the laws of physics to try to stabilize this thing and hover it all the way down to the ground, finally separate, and then land my cargo. So now we've deployed a satellite, we've landed a landing vehicle with a Kerbal on board, we've deployed a rover, we've deployed three pieces of equipment, we've landed additional cargo, and now we're finally taking the MEV over to that additional cargo to collect it. Hopefully find a moon or rock to scan along the way to perform additional research, deploy the rest of that equipment, and then finally we'll return to orbit, and then ultimately, hopefully, return to Kerbin itself. This rover actually functions pretty well. Um, it's got a pretty low center of mass uh, in testing. It did great on Kerbin, but as soon as you get in micro gravity, as we all know, uh, they have a tendency to kind of slide around and tip and what have you. But uh, I'm very satisfied with the aesthetics. I think it looks really cool um, and it's highly functional. So here we have Bob arriving to that cargo canister that was delivered via probe. And he is transferring all that equipment back into his rover, which he can then take back to the landing site. As Bob gets on board, he looks around and he notices that there's a moon or rock right next to the landing site of the probe core. So Bob decides to go over there and perform some additional science before finally returning back to the landing site. And just like all the deployable stuff that became available in Breaking Ground, I actually never used the scanning arm either. But look at this, man. I'm, I'm very satisfied with the way that this worked out. I don't know if it was by design or what have you, but that arm manages to somehow just slip beautifully right between the two rover wheels, examine that moon or rock, and then beautifully fold right back in there. The Bob on board the whole time. Really cool, really cool. All right, with our scan of our moon or rock finally complete, Bob gets back on board and heads back towards the landing site where he arrives and then quickly goes to work deploying the rest of the science experiments so that his research outpost on the surface of the moon, the landing site for the Galahad 2, are all fully operational before he departs. I also love that there's these kind of little animations in the audio cues associated with each one of the uh, experiments as they're deployed. Really cool. Developers did an awesome job with this update and adding all this other stuff. It's, it's really satisfying to use. We get our last piece of equipment finally deployed. Use the opportunity to hide the HUD and get a beautiful cinematic shot. And like we always do before we leave any planetoid, satellite, or what have you, you've got to take the opportunity to plant your flag. So with six pieces of equipment finally deployed, a rover deployed, cargo on the ground, a satellite in orbit, it is finally time for Bob to board the landing craft and prepare to launch back into orbit, conduct an orbital rendezvous with the crew of the Galahad 2 and the service module, and then ultimately return to Kerbin. So, being very careful not to activate too much thrust that would damage anything on the ground, Bob secures an altitude of roughly 200 meters over the landing site and then deploys his landing legs, shedding excess unnecessary weight, reducing the total mass of his craft, increasing its delta V, and then orients along that maneuver node and performs the orbital maneuvers required to generate an encounter with the service module where he will finally rejoin his two crewmates. There's actually no docking point or docking port on the landing module, so because the, la the dock is simply unnecessary. The only time it needed to capture anything was with the uh, rover earlier on in the mission, and having completed that, there's no reason for Bob to have to actually rendezvous and dock. Instead, he just needs to get close enough to get out of the lander, use his EVA pack to head back over to the service module, board that capsule, and then finally reunite himself with the rest of the crew. And everyone is overjoyed finally to be back together. We plan another maneuver node that's going to allow us to escape the moon's sphere of influence 
And with the camera tools mod, you finally get an appreciation for truly how fast you're moving at some of these orbital speeds. So we're going 800 meters a second over the surface of the moon, significantly faster than that over the surface of Kerbin. And all that speed is relative as we move through space. But man, when you get that flyby view, it's pretty amazing. Kerbin capture is now complete. As always, we set the goal of returning to as close to the space center as possible so that our vessels are easily retrieved by the rest of the Kerbal Space Program crew, and this time will be no different. So that giant Atlas V looking rocket that we began with, all those stages, all those pieces of equipment have been shed now, and most of which are on the surface of the moon are on suborbital trajectories elsewhere in the solar system. Finally, our crew in their capsule are fighting friction and fighting heat on the way back into the atmosphere of Kerbin as that camera shakes and we get a gorgeous view of that re-entry and we can see Kerbal Space Center in the background. We have plenty of heat shield on our capsule so that ablator is melting away and protecting everyone on board. The speeds that we're reaching are nowhere near high enough to put them in jeopardy and we get a good deployment of both radial mounted parachutes that should deploy momentarily as they do and that will lower then safely the crew of Galahad 2 all the way to the surface of Kerbin, just a few kilometers away from the Kerbal Space Center. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, make sure to watch the cinematic version of this same mission, which is linked on screen earlier in this video and will be linked on the end screen right now. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.